So, good afternoon, there, ladies and gentlemen. We start the last session today. Uh, it's uh, BIM for Cultural Heritage and Digital Archaeology. And the first speaker is Dr. Jan Frolik from Institute of Archaeology from uh, Academy of Science, uh, Czech Republic. And uh, his uh, uh, title is Rescue Archaeological Research and its Importance in the Protection of Cultural <coughs> Heritage. Dr. Frolik, you have time to continue. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for kind of invitation for this conference, which is really, you know, it is not very often in archaeology. And from the opposite side, I must apologize for the first half of my contribution because it's based on the dry language of the law for protection of monuments, but it's necessary something to say about the terminology. And the second half is uh, some case studies of examples from the non-destructive uh, method used of no methods, result used in, in archaeology. Then cultural heritage is today supposed as a normal part of our social life. This is understood as an as a assemblage of the important object documenting activities of the, of the <coughs> people in the past in the particular area. Uh, the reason for the doing of this assemblage of this object is the protection <coughs> from the damage and destruction. Systematic interest in protection has been appearing in Europe. In fact, very rare since the Middle Ages, but for the whole countries in the whole Europe since the ninth century, which is the same starting is is in the Czech Republic. Archaeological monument are two kinds of the archaeological monuments, immovable. That means, for instance, mounds or walls, uh, ramparts of the, of the prehistoric sites, or movable, that means the attractive single object, have been included in this assemblage in the second half of the 19th century, too. And uh, very necessary to say that we often used as evidence of very distant past and glorious and great past of territory of. of of nations, it's the same for the for the Czech Czech country. Uh, during the second half of the 19th century, starting the interest of the governments to protect these monuments, there are first regulations. These regulations are in the face of the law. That means the first are the in fact the by the government supported group of volunteers taking care of some monuments, including the archaeological, archaeological one. And in the same time, that means the second half of the 19th century, archaeology became a scientific branch both at the universities. There is Bohemia's very rare example because the first professor of archaeology is 1850. That means, for instance, at the, Danes, the same time <coughs> as in the United Kingdom. The first regulation of archaeology in our country is paradoxically in the war time, that means 1941. And the <coughs> real law for protection of monuments was <coughs> sorry, adopted in 1958 and replaced by the next law in, uh, in 1987, which is used till today with many repairings and many efforts to change it, but without, without results. As a comparison, the oldest law for protection of Europe is in the Sweden in the 17th century. That means the Czech Republic has 300 <laughs> later law than, than Sweden. Uh, archaeological monuments, with exception of this immovable, has a has a one very strange characteristic that means they are invisible. They are mainly invisible. We have a area where could be very interesting archaeological finds, but not visible on the surface. That is problem to establish the area where are these where are these monuments 
age and so on and so on. What is big problem in the protection of this monument? Not visible, but it's difficult to <coughs> protect it. <coughs> and the specific feature of archaeological monuments, archaeological finds, is it's in fact no in other scientific branch that research of this site means the total destruction of this site without some something simple, something similar, sorry. That means bad made archaeological excavations mean the destruction of the information and the destruction of this cultural heritage. That means if, if it's archaeology is digging the archaeological site, there is a high responsibility for high quality of this work, high quality of moving of this site into the original written sources today to the elected sources or the documentation and the finds. That is why the archaeology is educated at universities and archaeological excavation can to do only the person with the permit from the Ministry of Culture. The next strange characteristic is that if you have for instance garden the house plot it is our own ownership without no doubt, but with one exception. The archaeological finds in your house plot is a property of the region. That means you can to build something or to dig without permit of the state, government, of region, because there is a there is a danger of the destruction of important archaeological finds. That means important part of the cultural heritage. <coughs> That's why that in the law is the way how to <coughs> do it. That means that every builder, every owner which, <coughs> which is thinking to do something, must ask in the Institute of Archaeology if it's area projected for some building activity, the <coughs> area with the archaeological finds. It is, a, it is in the law. If it's archaeological institute, say no, it is no problem. You can do what, what, do, you, what do you wish. If the archaeological institute says yes, that, that means that the owner of this house plot, garden, or so <coughs> must allow and tolerate the rescue archaeological excavation and in the second step, mainly to pay it. Because this money are used for the saving the property of the region and to saving this property in fact forever in the museum and so on as a part of the cultural, cultural heritage. And <laughs> there is a next strange characteristic because if it's said the term protection of monuments, you imagine for us that means that for instance some medieval church must be protected <coughs> from the damage used in the big building stay and so on and so on, protecting to <coughs> keep it <coughs> in the situation this is as best as possible. But in the archaeology, protection is a protection, one kind of a protection is the protection of the site undiscovered, undiscovered on the site and, and, and nothing will visit. It is the best preservation for the archaeological site. But if it is excavated, this process of the moving the site from the site to the documentation and, and museum storages is also understood as a protection of, of this monument. And this documentation is by the law protected in the museum as a part of the cultural heritage. <laughs> and on the original site is something completely, <coughs> completely different at this moment. <coughs> that <coughs> yeah, there are there are several steps. What to do if archaeologists receive the information? What to do that will be some project or some building activities begin and so on. It was something said in the in the previous <laughs> previous contributions. That means the first is a search about all knowledge about the previous activities on site. Is better if that's an archaeological one, but it's all site. And the second part is a non-destructive server, which is one part is archaeological. It is, for instance, the arable area, 
the archaeologists go to this area and looking on the surface, on the pieces of pottery and so on, as a as a significant for archaeological site or not. The next one are of course this uh, non-destructive, mainly geophysical documentation and so on, <coughs> which are today normally normally include very wide range of ge geophysical methods. And the next, what is in fact new in the archaeology, uh, is documentation using the 3D documentation, laser scanning, 3D photogrammetry, and so on, which is not only a part of a moving the information about the site from the site to the, to the documentation, but, a, but, but as a part of a documentation of the current state of every monument, in fact, because the detailed documentation of current state is probably for every monument very important because for the thinking about the future in the future stay of the river monument the worse in the future than today the detailed information about present day stay is, is, is perfect for us it's a theoretical introduction and now <laughs> several several samples several case studies <coughs> mainly for my activities in archaeology it is a Hrudin in Eastern Bohemia, a road bypass 2011, where the investor pay very wide range of the method of non-destructive destructive surveys. I think it was one of the first using multispectral aerial survey with the result, which is giving us good data, but big interpretation in the first step. There was detected in the in this part of this by road bypass 11 sites with some anomalies, irregularities from the first step interpreted it could be archaeology. None of them will be archaeology or will be geology, pedology, some natural uh, natural uh, origin and so on. That means that it's Result for archaeologists is that it's very carefully to study these these anomalies and not suppose that it will be <coughs> it will be archaeology. The the next one is similar. It is the in the Hrudin too in the corner of the medieval historical center is this tower. This is the Pulver Bastion built in the 15th century. The owner that means the town of city of Hrudin prepared the reconstruction and made the ground penetrating radar before excavations. Uh, it's a nice example of of situation where the wish is the father of interpretation because the the company doing this 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 uh, research prepared perfect data there is an interpretation of, of two two profiles there is visible this curve, which was by the town interpreted as a vault of the underground room in the under the basement of the tower. It, it's crazy because it the town supposes this for a very long time that with an unknown space must be with some treasures of and, and so on and so on. That means which was the father of the interpretation. It is the sharp edge between two layers, one with many stones and second without stones. No underground part, no underground room, but it was it was it was clear before starting of the excavation because in the tower you cannot find the space where must be the entrance in this supposed underground part. There are some for me historical <laughs> historical example. It is first using of the lidar, uh, sorry, laser scanning in archaeology from 2005. <coughs> right in the existing monument that is the part of the of the Romanesque uh, 
Church of St. Mauritius and part of the Romanes Basilica of St. Vincent, St. White uh, at, uh, in, at, at Prague Castle. It was it was in 2005. Suppose it is fantastic from the today point of view. It is not not so so good, but it's interesting to compare the same wall documented in 2005 and documented today. There are small small changing, which are illustrating the situation of the stable be work work on yards. The next one used next year in one big excavation in Frugin 2, Radebni Street, three house plot, with one completely during the 30th war deserted medieval house with two levels of the pillars and assemblage of the rubbish pits. That means the 3D documentation using, <coughs> using laser scanning. The, all these Building construction was completely destroyed by the underground car uh, car park, which is today on, on this on this site. <coughs> there is a there is a next important example of the 3D documentation of very important find, which is not only the keeping the stay from the 2013, but it. It will be the big page of this of this uh, construction. Only only heritage about the original situation. It is the uh, proposal car park in front of the hotel named Bohemia in the in the in the Krugin. And one of the most important is in this site. That is was the Jewish ritual bath Mikwe, which is dated. According to uh, written sources before 1656 and archaeologically to the second half of the 16th century and first half of the 17th century. Ritual bass, medieval ritual bass is rare in, in our country. And what is the exception for the whole Europe are the two basins. Normal Mikwe has only one water basin and there are two. The, the similar are in the Near East only. Uh, very shortly after after finding of, the, of, of this request, we prepared the application <coughs> for Minister of Culture to put this, this monument into the National List of Cultural Heritage. It, it was 2014. The decision is not till today. And there are three possibilities of, of fate of this monument. Preservation on site and the documentation moving to the another side because the, 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 the Mikves is, is in the in the area of the car park. <laughs> moving save the monument with the losing of the authenticity. And third part is dozering during the building activities. And that means that the 3D documentation will be the most <coughs> important <coughs> for, for us. There is a, another, another some example of 3D documentation and 3D photogrammetry. It's a deserted village Lezaki, destroyed by Nazis during the Second World War. And there is no authentic part of the building in the whole protected area. There is some open air museum still today and we are asked to check the stay of the underground part of one of this building. <coughs> the building are very, are very bad building stay that it is not possible to exhibit this for, for public and the 3D documentation is only only possible documentation without Next destruction of all these of all these construction. And there is last of my of my samples. It is the Kutnahora Sedlets with the famous Osuare, and we made uh, big rescue excavations around the whole Osuare. 
because of uh, reconstruction of the of the basement and one of the important finds was the 32 mass grave of victims of famine, <laughs> 1318 and Clark Black Death in the 1348. Uh, we made for all graves, not only this mass grave, the 3D documentation, the photogrammetry documentation, which of course is possible to finish after the finish of the excavation, because during the excavations are more and more uh, not more photographs and give us the possibility to return to the site which is destroyed till today and study the details which are probably not supposed during the time of the excavation or to find new relationships and, and, and so on and so on that I prepared this we have it this is an example of one of these mass graves this one was this black sign and there is a possible to reconstruct it is a three-dimensional means then or so how it was filling from the bottom to the up. And study the fate of these victims of black death. From these uh, from these mass graves we have one thousand and two hundred of skeletons. And now I ask for as a last example a typical typical documentation for for present day situation of the monument. <coughs> Very short long video if you but I don't know what you will see, but it is the basilica in Tallinn. Tallinn is not in Estonia, it is in Tallinn in the Western Armenia. It is an important building, important Armenian mon monument from the 7th century. And you be asked for the nation of the Lake of Skellige, photos and uh, aerial documentation from the Neuron to As a, as a documentation of current day, as a one part of the prepared atlas catalog of important archaeological and, and, and architectural site in, in Armenia. This basilica was built in the 7th century, partly destroyed by the earthquake in the 17th century with some attempt to for reconstruction in the 70s of the last century, unfinished and now is in, in the state. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Prodi, for your presentation. And we are a little bit late, but uh, if you have some questions to Dr. Prodi, please now. Okay, if not, so. So, the second presentation is. Presenter is uh, uh, Karol Pavelka Jr. Uh, he is a PhD student at our university, uh, Department of Geomatics, and um, his uh, presentation is photogrammetry, laser scanning, and uh, HBIM for construction diagnostic. Afternoon to everyone. And um, I want on the, this case study, uh, show you how all this mentioned technology can work together and what results you can get when you combine all of uh, this method, like photogrammetry, laser scanning, and HBIM. 
the case study is uh, the documentation of the minaret, which is uh, located in the heart of the Al Qala Citadel in Erbil in uh, the northern Iraq, in Kurdistan. And um, we have unknown situation about uh, the minaret. We don't know the static and it's visibly deformated. So we use how much technology we can get with us because you are restricted by the heaviest of your luggage. Uh, and uh, it's important to choose a most compatible and smaller devices what you can get to take uh, to the destination like the Iraq. And also there is a, some special restriction about the drones, of course. And uh, you need to ask, the we use the DJI Mavic and you need to, to ask DJI to permit because it's red flying zone. You can fly uh, whichever you take the drone in. And um, our target of this study is uh, to document presenting uh, situation about uh, about the minaret and uh, do it more more precision as we can. So our main target is the precision of all the measurements and also. Uh, for the visibilities of all the deformation and also a uh, most important thing uh, about the decoration about the mineral. It, it, it contains the small glazy bricks and it is deformated under some places and they want to do some facade plans and reconstruct uh, every glaze. So this is the method and the devices what we use in this study. Uh, for laser scanning, we use the BLK360. It's a compact one one button uh, laser scan, and uh, laser scan is a prevo, which is uh, it look like the handle. You can see it here, and it's working with the slum technology. So you can go out from outside, inside, and uh, doing. Uh, the really good uh, base data for uh, the vectorization and the plan. For photogrammetry, uh, for close range photogrammetry, we use the normal camera Canon. And for aerial photogrammetry, as I said, uh, we use the DJI Mavic Pro. So we are trying to take uh, these devices to do uh, like an example because every device has some advantage for some results. So we use the VLK uh, 360 for the precision and combine it with the uh, photogrammetry together and the approval to have uh, the good plans uh, about, uh, about the inside of our walls and also from the outside. Here is how it looks like. Uh, the laser scan, uh, we take the 13 scans around the object and uh, the approval has only one scan because it's working on the slum technology. So every scan is aligned automatically with another. And after that, you have only one result that is just one scan. For the photogrammetry, uh, we take around 1,100 pictures. It's a lot because uh, we always decide to take more data than we need maybe. But uh, it's not like uh, you can go one hour to some city around the Prague or, or sorry, around the Czech Republic and you can take the data again. So if you want to go in those special places like Iraq, you need uh, to have some permits. So we choose to take uh, more photographs than we need. And uh, it's also good because not all of the photos will align. There is a problem if you want to combine the terrestrial and aerial photogrammetry and uh, you need to save the angles. We find that uh, the ideal angle is around uh, 15 because uh, if you do it much, the difference between the aerial photos and an angle and the angle from the terrestrial photogrammetry is really bad and you have two separated models, one for the drone and one uh, from uh, the terrestrial. So um, we hope that it will work and it works and uh, almost all photos uh, go together and uh, we get the really nice model. And thanks to the scans, we also have the scale for it because uh, the terrestrial photogrammetry is scaleless. And uh, from the drone, you can use the GNS 
uh, GNSS, uh, but it's not precise like the laser scanning. And also, it is, it is a good check because of the deformation, and we want to save the deformation of the minerals, so you can uh, combine it, and you can check if uh, the normal photogrammetry don't have more deformation than uh, the object really has. This is uh, the basic results from the ZEPREVO, from uh, the SLAM technology. It looks like uh, X-ray photos, and uh, it's work really good that you can see a little bit from outside and also from the inside. So you can see uh, how the stairs is going upstairs, and you can see the deformation also. Uh, ZEPREVO has one up to three centimeters uh, on 10 meter precision. So it's not good for the statues and uh, some more precision uh, things, but uh, it's enough for the buildings and it's really fast. So you can only walk through and you can get a really nice, uh, really nice results. After that, it's so easy to vector it and do the vector plans from this data. So this is the one result what we get. The second result what we get also is uh, the photogrammetry result, as I said, which combine. Uh, with uh, with the laser scan and we can a really nice digital twin and uh, this model has around half million polygons and AK texture. The texture was really important for us because as I said on the beginning, we want uh, to do a precise plan, photo plan of the facade and uh, the texture for this is really important. But uh, we have the really big challenges here because um, we need to unroll the model and do a really good and precise photo plan of the facade of all of, with every bricks. And uh, um, as I said, the uh, minaret is deformated and every part uh, has another wireless. So we decide that uh, we will cut the model and uh, we will do uh, the this process for each part. One, the bottom part, the middle part, and the top part. The process, <clears throat> what we find, was really hard to find because if you know, we have a lot of the format of the model, a lot of the software, and if you convert it to the software, the software don't read it and you need to convert it from another format. So uh, we find uh, the really good feature in the Cloud Compare but it's not working with the mesh. So we used uh, the 3D mesh, and after the 3D mesh, we all again uh, transfer it to the cloud because the cloud from the mesh is, uh, is more straight and it is good for the unrolling. And after that, you unfold and unroll the model and do the mesh again. And after that, you can render it as a file. And this is the results of it. The first step, what you already got, you got the corners here, and after that you unroll it. It's a still it's a still cloud point, and after that you will transfer it, and um, you have the really nice, uh, really nice uh, plan of the facade. What is really hard that you need to take the polyline, and because we want to save the deformation of the object, you need to draw by the polyline around all of the circle of it, step by step, I think around 20, meter, 20 centimeters and uh, unfold it straightly. So uh, this is the results. This is the results with the scale. And uh, that's it. We have the photo plans of the facade, really detailed and really precise from all of the parts. And only one solution was to cut uh, the minerals to the part. And this is all for me. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for your question. Thank you for this presentation and this time maybe yeah. one two questions. Have you established a geodetic network for the ground control points or because you have many sources and yes. you need to coordinate. 
the sauce to bring yes, to, yes. The, to so the... We take we take from each technology the best what we can and we combine it together. That how is, how is, how did you do it? Cloud uh, cloud to cloud or yes yes in the in the cloud we and you trust the, the, the magic web software and combine it. So when you have the problem on the one side, um, there was there was a speakers around. So the speakers so was better. Uh, from the photogrammetry aerial, then from the laser scan, because there is no uh, no station up to we take them. So you cut it and you replace it with it. It was it was work, but uh, we have the really good model, the complex one. So no artificial uh, control. No, no, points. no. We are doing uh, it manual. Okay. Thank you. Maybe one question more. If not, thank you very much. So I will invite the third speaker, which is Raffaele Argiolas, University of Cagliari, Italy, with a presentation about the virtual environment to communicate built cultural heritage, uh, HBIM based on a based virtual tool. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rafael Azonas, I'm a PhD student at the University of Cagliari. Uh, today, I uh, present an uh, um, uh, um, example of uh, <clears throat> a series of uh, experimentations that uh, we are um, carrying on uh, about the uh, use of uh, HB uh, models in um, apps for uh, communication um, of the architecture. Uh, as we know, the um, BIM methodology is attracting more and more uh, interest in um, its heritage uh, application. Okay. Uh, this because uh, it was um, the project was created for uh, new buildings. It share many aspects with the uh, study of uh, built heritage, such as multidimensional or multidisciplinary approach uh, that we um, help to get uh, together information in a single model and the vision of uh, architectures as a collection of information uh, and a rela relationship. So uh, a building is not a single object, but it is a, a union of more objects and the uh, relationship. Uh, in uh, recent year, uh, years, uh, a new use of uh, BIM models is becoming uh, an important topic in research. The, uh, okay. uh, um, the integration in uh, virtual environments. Uh, uh, virtual environments uh, allow us to simulate the space, uh, also from a sensory uh, point of view, facilitating the communication of, it, of architecture and uh, enabling interaction with that. Uh, the HB methodology finds practical uh, application in the uh, scan to beam processes uh, that we can uh, see somewhere. Sorry, I don't know why, but what's going on? Okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the um, scan to beam processes uh, uh, can be summarized in a, a scan like uh, you can see in this slide. So a first part of data gathering and a, a second part of the, uh, model generation. Since the uh, modeling that uh, we use for these models uh, are not so uh, distant from the, a classical workflow, uh, we prefer. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, since the modeling is, uh, uh, we follow our um, standard workflow. Uh, 
for this presentation, we uh, decided to focus on the, the next step. So uh, that to creation. Uh, to create the virtual tool, we extended the classical workflow by exporting the HB models uh, created be, uh, with Autodesk Revit, importing them in uh, the Unity game engine. Uh, the process was used in the past for uh, other uh, prototypes in uh, different case, case studies. So in order to understand, because we want to uh, use virtual tools for communicate the, uh, the heritage, uh, we have to uh, understand what the uh, 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 virtual environments are. Uh, so we can uh, use the definition the, that Kaleya gives up in uh, 29. Uh, Kaleya stated that uh, virtual environments are computer generated domains uh, which create a repetition of uh, traversable space and uh, for the uh, extension of uh, player agency. They are populated by object or often uh, human or uh, AI controlled entities uh, which one players can interact with. Uh, regarding the experience that the user uh, can live in a virtual environments in uh, 1997, uh, Murray defined uh, the concept of immersion, referring to video games uh, as an alternative dimension outside the reality in which one uh, remains almost suspended as long as the uh, active creation of belief uh, uh, persists. In 2011, Kaleya uh, overtake the Murray's uh, concept with that of incorporation. Uh, that is we define as a uh, assertion of a virtual environment into uh, consciousness, yielding a sense of habitation. Uh, this is uh, this uh, assertion, uh, this incorporation, is what we want to reach with uh, the use of virtual tools. Uh, in addition, when virtual uh, environment uh, represent a real place, because uh, we can uh, represent as an imaginary place. But when the virtual tool is in uh, real, is um, set in real place, uh, they can arouse curiosity in the user, can generate attachment, and increase the engagement. In some cases, we can even go uh, so far uh, as to speak of uh, topophilia. Is the first necessary for the space to be uh, recognizable uh, by the user, and uh, every element must be distinguishable uh, and identifiable. However, this must uh, be done by compromising with the uh, complexity of the model itself, uh, which must be uh, appropriately uh, calibrated for us purpose, uh, avoiding the over ventilation. Uh, it was, uh, it, uh, was uh, the, uh, decided to adopt a level of detail uh, comparable to level of detail uh, 300 uh, for elements with uh, simple geometry or for this, uh, for the uh, geometries are very complex, but they, uh, when they follow a uh, precise uh, geometric rules, they can be converted in a uh, modeling processes. On the other hand, uh, um, a level of uh, detail of uh, 200 was adopted for that element that are very complex and follow very complex rules that is uh, difficult to uh, be translated or standard basis. For the application of the method, uh, we showed a uh, decade study of the former uh, Jesuitic complex uh, of Santa Croce in Cagliari. Uh, it was designed in the second half of the 16th century, and uh, it can be considered the first uh, of the organically uh, baroque uh, architecture in Sardinia. The complex is composed by uh, two bodies separated by a portico. In particular, the body on the east uh, was enlarged by the Piemontese uh, architect, uh, sorry, uh, architect Antonio Felice de Vincenti between. Uh, uh, 1725 and 1773. Uh, De Vincenti cre uh, created a two-level atrium, open one uh, inside on a cloister garden. 
Uh, the large space is uh, architecturally defi defined by ten cross uh, walls arranged on a double row resting on a, uh, some floated uh, columns. The survey of the atrium was uh, carried on uh, through laser scanning for a total of uh, nine scans. Uh, some of the main information uh, are report, uh, uh, shown in this slide. And uh, the point cloud was uh, registered uh, using the software, uh, the software Autodesk uh, Recap to be uh, uh, late imported in uh, ready. Regarding the modeling uh, processes, he uh, used uh, two approaches. The standard elements like uh, walls, space, uh, floors, etc., uh, was modeled uh, using a parametric modeling. Uh, regarding capitals, that also was modeled with a parametric uh, modeling, um, we have to make a um, more precise uh, study because this type of elements uh, are in the category that we said that, uh, that need. Uh, um, a lower detail because they don't follow uh, simple rules like other elements. So in this phase, we uh, can choose to use or a mesh model that give us uh, more details, but uh, uh, hard to reuse in a, in a model when uh, some difference are found. So in this case, we uh, decided to use a schematic model that gives the, the user the idea of the type of the element and the position. Uh, regarding the vaults and the uh, shaft of the columns, instead we, uh, in the past, uh, developed uh, some modeling algorithm based on the uh, treaties uh, rules uh, using the, the uh, DPL uh, environment uh, Autodesk Dynamo within Revit. This allows us to um, automate part of the, uh, of the process and speed up the modeling uh, and, uh, for this element that are um, of a complex shape but follow a relatively simple rules. Uh, in addition, the algorithm modeling allows us to implement uh, some complex rules like the construction of the entity. In this case, we chose to uh, implement the construction by Zignola. Uh, okay, in this uh, image, we can see the final model and uh, a station uh, extracted by the, the model. Uh, okay, so when uh, we finish with the modeling, we have to decide the development to develop the tour. Uh, we chose to use uh, Unity because of this uh, relative simplicity to develop a small uh, prototype. Uh, therefore, the white shows of three assets can, can, help, uh, can help us to uh, develop the prototype. Uh, we use uh, user uh, unit in the past, so uh, it gives us a continuity for the research. Uh, for the uh, exchange uh, format between uh, the application, applications, we use uh, FBS uh, format. Because it can uh, use can be directly used uh, and exported from Revit and imported in uh, in, um, in Unity, uh, preserving some important uh, characteristics like the materials, the light, or the hierarchy of the elements. Uh, in the tool that we developed, we uh, integrated the basic uh, physics and uh, the collider mechanics uh, that allow the user to move, to jump, to go up and down the stairs uh, and interact with the architecture. That's uh, all action that uh, help the uh, immersion of the user in the virtual environment. Uh, all these all, uh, uh, actions are explained to the user through a tutorial screen uh, that we can see here. And uh, for the type of the comments, we decided to use uh, classical com uh, the classical comments that uh, we can find in a uh, third-person shooting video game, because they are studied uh, uh, for the, uh, to be simple for the user to, to learn. Uh, at the moment, we uh, implemented the three types of uh, integration with the models, with the environment. Uh, the first one, 
involve the opening of a, a information panel that can give the uh, user some information like, uh, uh, for example, this, uh, just uh, some example, uh, works of the same actor, uh, historical treaties, uh, geometrical analysis, and uh, oh, uh, video animation uh, about the uh, construction technique. Another, uh, the second type of integration involves uh, the uh, overlay of uh, some analysis on the model. Uh, so uh, we can show uh, analysis about uh, the state of decay, the uh, identification of materials, historical certification, and so on. The last type of uh, integration uh, involves the use of uh, some material uh, here that we can see here. Okay. The integration with the sphere uh, involves a change of the environment. So we can show uh, the actual uh, state, the current status of the of the place, of the, of the space, but also uh, some uh, simulation of the past state, the past states, uh, hypothesis on the uh, future restorations, uh, or maybe change the light uh, configuration to uh, to explain how the place can be. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, even if we are in a uh, at the start of the experimentation of the tools, uh, the advantage of uh, use uh, a structured HP model is uh, is evident for uh, the use in the tool because of the preservation of the old information about the uh, geometries, but also uh, the configuration of the space. Uh, in addition, the game uh, engine allows us to uh, use more uh, integration with. Uh, between users and model, uh, models that help the uh, player, the player, the user to uh, emerge in the uh, in the tour. Uh, in the future, uh, we uh, want to uh, expand the type of the interaction and find that space uh, represented itself because now uh, we uh, limited it to the atom of the complex. Yeah, there are some uh, of future implementation could be, for example, the implementation of game mechanics to uh, develop a prototype, prototypes of uh, serious games, for example. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and uh, short time for, for questions, please. If no. Thank you, and uh, thank you for my last presenter today. The last presenter is Narayeva, which is a PhD student uh, uh, in uh, at our faculty, Department of Geomatics. Um, she has a presentation named uh, Gathering Geodata for HBIM for uh, and analysis on preserving of, uh, of Caravan Serai. It is about documentation of historical effects, uh, partially uh, in ruins. Uh, not Good evening, everyone. My name is Paulina Rava, and uh, I'm part of the Department of Geomatics uh, here at the Faculty of uh, Civil Engineering. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to the organizing committee for the great event. I haven't been to a conference for uh, three years, so thank you. Um, my presentation will be on uh, geodata for historical uh, building information modeling. Uh, our study case uh, is a type of building called uh, Caravansarai in the city of uh, Koisinjak in the Iraqi part of uh, Kurdistan. Sorry. <clears throat> um, the goal of our research team was to uh, capture due data of uh, the current state uh, of the Khan Karansarai, uh, process this data even on site so that uh, it will be possible to. Uh, Show it to uh, local authorities and decision makers in order to uh, seek for uh, future uh, funding in order to um, uh, restore and preserve uh, the whole building. And of course, uh, we did some further analysis and vectorization uh, 
from our global data. Um, I personally uh, really like uh, the term geo data. Uh, it's not only a word, but uh, it uh, actually captures a few uh, parameters. Um, when dealing with uh, geo data, there are a few questions that we need to uh, ask uh, not only ourselves, ourselves, but uh, also the uh, investors. Uh, for example, uh, the question where um, answers uh, uh, to the correct position of uh, the object in the site, uh, and uh, of course gives answers to um, the required precision, the coordinate reference system, etc. What to be exactly measured is also important. What details, uh, etc. And uh, having these uh, two answers, uh, we can uh, now easily um, define the technology or answer the question of how to capture this geodata. And um, since uh, uh, starting uh, uh, working with BIM and facility management, uh, the question when the data was captured uh, has become uh, also really important. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me introduce you our study case and uh, the exact location. Um, the city of um, Koisinjak is located uh, in the Iraqi part of uh, Kurdistan. Uh, we are working um, uh, in a building, uh, type of building called uh, Caravanserai, which is in, uh, uh, in the old part of uh, the city, um, nearby uh, many other historical buildings, uh, nearby the, the main uh, mosque of the city. Um, <clears throat> here we can see uh, actually an image of uh, the current state of uh, this type of uh, building, uh, Carolan Sarai. Um, I think it is, um, um, it could be easily deducted uh, what might happen here. It is actually a result of um, um, military actions. And uh, the current state of uh, the building is uh, unfortunately, um, well, almost uh, ruined. Working on such projects abroad, uh, for me personally, it's really interesting because there are many. Uh, uh, foreign words which actually mean something. So uh, uh, I would like to speak uh, uh, briefly about the etymology of uh, the words that I'm going to be using in this presentation. So um, also the case is located in this uh, city called Kosinjak, uh, which uh, word has the Turkish roots, Kon means a village, and uh, Sinjak uh, respectively means a flag. So basically we're speaking about uh, the village with the flag. And um, the building that uh, we were working on uh, is actually a type of building. Um, it's called Karavanserai. And it has uh, either Persian or Turkish roots again, where caravan uh, means uh, caravan and the sara could mean either place or building. So uh, we can actually conclude that this uh, building uh, used to uh, get a people who had uh, caravans. Um, but um, why this uh, building is so important and what are actually the aspects of this camp? Uh, yeah, it uh, requires reconstruction because it's not only a historical uh, building, it's not only uh, positioned in the historical old town of uh, the city. Not only it dates back to the 19th century and not only its current state is uh, almost destructed, but it's uh, really important to uh, even our European culture. Um, because these um, caravanserais uh, types of buildings were um, usually positioned on the Silk Road. They could be found uh, between uh, Turkey and China. There are many of them, not only in uh, Iraq, uh, but also in the neighboring countries. Um, these buildings uh, used to uh, serve um, not only local, but also uh, foreign uh, merchants, where they uh, uh, actually needed a place to uh, stay overnight. And um, of course, they carried their different goods and the things that they uh, uh, used to sell or buy in uh, their caravans. And they not only exchanged their goods or uh, made money, but they also exchanged uh, culture, language between other merchants. And of course, all of this uh, led to uh, creating places uh, which was full of uh, uh, which was filled 
uh, with um, uh, architectural um, elements uh, coming from different uh, places uh, from Asia, Europe, uh, etc. The structure of uh, the Ken Caravanserai uh, that we were working on is um, a square building um, where in between uh, there is a central court. There are only two stories of uh, the building uh, and uh, the spaces where the merchants wish to uh, uh, sleep or um, talk or communicate between each other are called chambers. Um, the plant emergency safeguard measures that we might call them at the can caravanserai proceed to um, uh, stabilize and uh, preserve uh, the second parts of uh, the structure. And of course, the first steps prior to every reconstruction must be to uh, take uh, geodetic measurements of the current state of uh, the building. Uh, the materials and methods that uh, we used uh, are actually two types of uh, laser scanning method. The first one is the so-called uh, SLAM. And um, we uh, used uh, the handheld uh, laser scanner Zipo Evo and um, the classic uh, laser scanner for Dressler laser scanning uh, uh, Laker 360. Uh, also, uh, we took photogrammetric uh, measurements uh, by uh, both types of uh, medical, as my colleague uh, Carol uh, also mentioned. Uh, in countries like Iraq, there are many restrictions flying, but uh, fortunately, uh, Professor Padoka is also able to uh, uh, deal with these restrictions and uh, actually take uh, great aerial data. Um, so um, I'm going to present uh, a few of uh, the preliminary results that we did, and um, uh, maybe it is uh, actually uh, um, uh, good to say here that uh, in uh, such places like uh, ruins, uh, the sun technology is uh, better or preferred because. Uh, Yes, it might be not so precise as uh, classic laser scanning for uh, geodetic measurements, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we have only one scanning, and if we uh, take uh, uh, these measurements uh, correctly, even if uh, there is a precision around uh, three or four centimeters, it could be enough uh, for uh, such uh, cases like uh, ours. So. Um, uh, here we prepared to actually um, uh, ready file where we created uh, just uh, two simple sections of uh, the two floor plans of the so-called uh, chambers of the Kanka Ravanserai. And uh, uh, here we can um, define a bit um, uh, different outputs um, it's uh, actually the same uh, point cloud, uh, but uh, in uh, different um, software products. The first one is from uh, Geoslam, uh, which is actually uh, the manufacturer of um, the handheld scanner. And the second the cross section is um, the same point cloud, but in Autodesk Reddit. Uh, and uh, uh, well, we can actually see that the first one is, uh, seems uh, a bit better to work with. And um, here are some of the preliminary results. Uh, we have uh, also a photo of, um, well, basically the ruins of the building uh, with uh, vectorized uh, chambers uh, where, it, where we can uh, detect uh, actually which parts are present and they uh, require um, a reconstruction of renovation uh, as uh, soon as possible. And uh, here we have a uh, auto photo map of the current state of uh, the council of Ansari. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and time for questions, please. Okay. If not, thank you very much. And uh, it was last presentation today. Um, enjoy the stay in Prague at our faculty and uh, I close the session. Thank you very much.